Good afternoon. My name is Kristen Mullen, and I'm the Director of Housing Development and Incentives for the Tulsa Authority for Economic Opportunity, or TAO. We are the public trust authority that serves as the lead entity for the city of Tulsa in carrying out community and economic development. Thank you for joining us today for a presentation on PSO's energy efficiency programs for single family residential rental properties. Before we begin today's presentation, I wanna share with you two opportunities for landlords and property managers at the city of Tulsa. First is the Abode Initiative, which provides information to landlords and property managers about resources and opportunities in the city of Tulsa, such as this webinar. You can receive regular email updates and also reach out to the city and TAO with questions or concerns that you may have. There is no cost to participating. Just email me at kmaun at cityoftulsa.org. The second is the Gold Star Landlord Program, a free and voluntary program that provides rewards and incentives for landlords and property managers who engage in the best rental practices. Incentives include advertising and promotion as a Gold Star Landlord and access to incentives funded by the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, such as landlord guarantee funds available from the Tulsa Day Center, Housing Solutions, Divis, and Tulsa Cares. For more information on the Gold Star Landlord Program, please visit cityoftulsa.org slash landlords or email goldstar at cityoftulsa.org. Today's presentation is on PSO's energy efficiency programs for single family residential rental properties. There will be an opportunity for questions, so please put your questions in the Q&A section. This presentation will also be recorded and made available online for sharing on the City of Tulsa's YouTube page. Thank you so much, and I will now turn it over to Jason Fisher. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, this is Jason Fisher. I am uh, a um, BPI, proc uh, BPI proctor and a home energy rater, and I work for a company called ICF International. We have the sole contract with PSO to run all of their energy efficiency programs. And uh, today we're going to be talking about the multiple upgrade program. This is for single family residences. Um, yesterday, we went through the multifamily program and uh, talked a little bit about it. So this is going to be a little bit different. Um, and just like yesterday, we walked through a couple of things as far as a safety thing. We always want to do a, a good safety message. And so the last one that we did yesterday was a little bit about um, gas leaks and um, the the hazards of uh, natural gas leaks and how we test form and that kind of thing. Today, it's gonna to be uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. And so carbon monoxide poisoning does these things on the right side or the, le the left side here. It gives you a dull headache, uh, weakness, dizziness, nausea and vomiting, shortness of breath, confusion, blurred vision, and loss of consciousness ultimately leads to death. Um, where does poison uh, carbon monoxide come from? Well, it comes from anything that burns something. It could be natural gas, it could be wood, it could be gasoline, diesel, it comes from a lot of different places. But in our houses, it's gonna primarily come from burning natural gas. And here are a couple of ways that it gets into your house. Uh, flues that are not connected correctly. There's a piece that's missing right here called the draft diverter. And that basically draws in fresh air at the bottom of this and it directs all of the hot gases up that flue that piece is missing and so that uh, exhaust is flowing right out into the house. This one right here is similar to the to that is just not connected correctly and so instead of the hot exhaust gases going through that pipe they're going to come out into the house and that could be potentially deadly. So make sure you get all of those fixed. Um, the PSO rebates are for duplexes, single family homes. We don't care if they're owned or if they're rental properties, but as long as they are basically a duplex and down, we're okay. And these are the measures that we can pay a rebate on. It's insulation, air sealing, knee wall, duct work, crawl space, um, HVAC replacement, um, pool pumps, occupancy sensors, and um, Wi-Fi thermostats, I'm sorry, you know that occupancy sensors is not correct, but Wi-Fi thermostats we can pay for. Uh, basically what a Wi-Fi thermostat is, is something that looks kind of similar to this. We've got a $75 rebate for these. Um, 
they are connected to the Wi-Fi, so you can uh, adjust them from your phone. There is a calendar typically in there that you can set so that they come on at uh, a certain time to a certain temperature, and then it goes off at another certain time at a certain temperature. Um, the other bad, the other big benefit to using one of these two, Nest or Ecobee, and then we've got a few other ones that are also connectable. But when they're Wi-Fi enabled and there's something like this, and they can connect to our system, and um, we can adjust those depending on um, the uh, the peak temperature of the day and that kind of thing. So if we have a peak event, in other words, we're using a whole bunch of electricity in the middle of the day, or maybe uh, usually those peak events are somewhere around three o'clock or five o'clock to around seven or eight o'clock. Um, we can adjust that down a little bit and save you guys a little bit of money. So um, make sure that you're using these Wi-Fi thermostats. Again, that rebate is $75. Pool pumps are another huge deal. Um, if you've got a pool pump that looks like that pool pump up there on the right, it's time to make that thing go away. Uh, the picture in the middle there is a new Pintar Energy Star pool pump. Um, these are really cool. They are, you're able to adjust them so that they can um, cycle the pool water uh, a certain amount of time so that it's, uh, it's efficient but it's not using so much energy. They also have a variable speed motor in them so that they can ramp up slowly or slow down slowly and you don't have that big jolt of energy right off the bat whenever the motor kicks in. And, um, and so these are far, far more energy efficient. We've got great rebates for these. So if you're looking for a good pool pump rebate, let me know. So the way that uh, our program works is we just basically look at the house as a whole system. It's, the, it's called a building as a system concept. And so various things impact other things. A good example would be the environment. If it's really hot outside, then we're gonna be air conditioning inside. But if we don't have the air sealing done correctly or ductwork is leaking and that kind of thing, well, we're gonna get into that a little bit closer here in a minute, but um, those systems, when they come on, they're pulling not only energy from the grid, but they're also pulling pollutant sources in from the outside. Uh, those pollutants may be pollen, mold, um, you know, mildew, various things like that that could be uh, really bugging you as far as the, um, your health is concerned. Um, so that's kind of what we do. And we make sure that the whole house is operating correctly. It's a lot like going to a general practitioner for your health. We know where the problems are and we can help you find somebody that can fix those problems fairly easily. Air sealing and insulation. So, I, you know, I put that together because air sealing and insulation should probably be combined. The reason for that is uh, typically what we use here in Oklahoma, it's a fiberglass insulation or, or sometimes cellulose. Neither one of those two products, those stop air. They allow air to flow through it. So if you have um, holes in various places, these are good places right here, the attic hatch, a recess lighting, a various fans around the fans, around the chimney. There's a whole bunch of places where um, they could be coming through. But you know, basically, if we don't stop that air leakage, then that air, the inside air, or what my grandma and grandpa used to say, the bot air, uh, the conditioned air is coming through that hole and into the hot attic. And basically you're just wasting a lot of energy. So let's seal those things up. Um, this is a good example of what we call the stack effect. So if you think about a chimney, that chimney has hot buoyant air in it. And that's what makes the smoke go out the top of the, the chimney. Well, a house is really kind of the same thing. So in the uh, winter time, cold air will come in towards the bottom of the house. Hot air will go exit out of the top of the house. And if we don't have those holes sealed up, we could have some real problems. This is how we test for this kind of stuff. The, uh, the picture on the left there is a blower door. And what we do, we replace the front door with this fabric door and a fan in it. And the fan is connected to a manometer. That's the little gauge that you see pictured there. And what happens is when we fire that up, it pulls the house down to a 50 Pascal pressure. 
and we can figure out where all of the holes are in the house. Um, a lot of times when I'm firing this thing up, I kind of walk through the house with my palms out. And if I can feel air on my palm, then I know that the hole is in front of me. If I feel air on the back of my hand, I need to turn around and find that hole somewhere else. The one on the right here is a duct blaster. And basically it's exactly the same thing as the blower door, only we connect these pieces of equipment to the uh, duct work in the HVAC system. And so when we fire this up, we pull that down to a 25 Pascal pressure and um, we can figure out not only how big the holes are and where they are, but we can help direct those contractors to, uh, to the biggest holes and figure out how we can fix those. There's various different ways we'll get into in a minute. So air sealing makes a huge difference. And these are a few places that I've taken pictures of that have been out in the field. The one on the left there, uh, the plumber came in, he replaced the toilet, he replaced some of the piping in there, but he forgot to do uh, one of the essential things and that's putting the sheetrock back, sealing that up and repainting that. The homeowner left it the way it is until we fired up that blower door and showed them that there was a tremendous amount of air that comes through that hole. The one in the middle there is in a closet, and this is the attic access. Um, as you can see, there's a pretty massive hole that's right there in the corner and right around it. The duct tape, I'm sorry, doesn't work, people. So uh, let's just eliminate that duct work or that duct tape and uh, actually fix this. The way you'd fix it is uh, you could put a hinge on it or some latches on it so it would pull that uh, plywood down closer or, or shut. Uh, put a uh, seal around the edge of that and then insulate the top of it. That would take care of that for you. Um, the other beauty of it is, you know, this is part of air sealing. So PSO has rebates for all of this stuff. The one on the right there, um, they had a leak up in the uh, attic and that leak, that water leak collapsed that sheetrock ceiling. Um, they were getting ready to fix this. So I, added, I went ahead and took a picture of that. But these are common sources. The bigger the hole is, the bigger the leak is, and um, the more benefit you are to actually fix that and, and make it better. Here are a couple of more. Um, this one on the left here is uh, basically, it's a, a plumbing penetration. This goes up if you would uh, step back a sec and then look up, you'd see the sink in the bathroom. And um, this is what it looks like after we're done with it. This is, they have uh, sealed that up really well, um, put some caulking around it and some mastic and that took care of that problem. The one on the right here is a, a passive vent that goes from the living space to the combustion appliance zone. Basically that's where the water heater or the furnace live. And the reason for this vent is so that those two combustion appliances will actually pull air, burn that air, and then push it up through the uh, flue pipe. The problem is when it's coming in that way, that air is communicating back and forth with the inside of the house. And as you can see, there's a massive space or gap there between the two pieces of sheetrock and that space goes all the way up to the ceiling or the attic. Um, so whenever it's drawing air, when the air conditioner comes on, it's pulling air through that hole. And uh, that air is really not stuff that we want to be breathing because there's dust and a whole bunch of stuff that's up in the attic. For those folks that have been up in the attic, I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about. The air up there is not exactly uh, the best air to breathe. And so we want to seal that up. And then the next step is attic insulation. Um, this is a great picture of R38 insulation. Um, no fiberglass bats are allowed in our program. This particular insulation here is cellulose. And if you look uh, pretty deep in there, let me see if I can get my little pointer here. This little piece right here is a ruler. We also require all of the contractors to put rulers in various places so that we can tell how deep that insulation is and not trample over it whenever that's uh, pristine and looking pretty. Um, we offer a $400 rebate for attic insulation, so it's a great deal. And um, now's the time to get that done because it's coming into the summertime. This is yet another way to attic, uh, to uh, seal up and insulate an attic. 
And this is called attic encapsulation. And so th what this is, is open cell foam, spray foam. It's a polyurethane based material. And they spray that on the uh, roof deck. That in, when you do this, you pull out all of the insulation inside so that the air barrier and the insulation is above the ductwork. That means that if there is a little bit of leakage on that ductwork, it's going inside the envelope and start, instead of going outside the way it did in the uh, previous picture. The other beauty of this is that a lot of times this will actually eliminate really high temperatures up in the attic. So usually it's about a five degree temperature difference between the inside of the house and the attic. Um, so it saves a trend, tremendous amount of money. Knee walls are another thing that we do. Um, this wall right here is a knee wall. Many upstairs houses, a lot of duplexes and stuff have these. And that wall, basically, it shares space with the inside of the house on one side and then the attic on the other side. This is what that looks like in the real world. Um, fiberglass insulation is typically just stapled onto the face of the sheetrock. Um, the problem with doing that is that there is a convective loop that runs along the surface of that sheetrock because the sheetrock heats up or cools down depending on what season you're in. And so there's a there's a cycle or a loop that flows along that sheetrock edge and it pulls the temperatures from one side of the substrate to the other side of the substrate. So what we wanna do is pull all that fiberglass insulation off and block it at the bottom and block it at the top and then spray R19 foam insulation on top of that so that you've got a, not only is it a better insulation as far as the R value goes, cause it's R19, but it's also uh, totally encapsulated all of the wood framing members. And so now you don't have any temperature fluctuations between the inside and the outside flowing through those um, framing members. It's a whole lot better way of, of taking care of that and fixing it. And we've got a $500 rebate for that. This is what it looks like in the real world when it's all finished. This is uh, uh, one of the projects that we finished, uh, uh, well, in, back in 2011. And you can see that when you're looking at that knee wall, you're not seeing any framing members at all. It's all encapsulated in foam. So that's what we really want to see. Crawl spaces. So crawl spaces are um, not only an energy efficiency problem, they're also a health problem. If you think of all of the stuff that lives down in a crawl space, it's probably not stuff that you want to be hanging out with or smelling or breathing. Um, there are basically two ways to fix crawl spaces, I'll get into those in just a little bit, but suffice to say that everything in the crawl space has to have closed cell foam and it has to be a minimum of 2.5 inches. Um, what that does, a 2.5 inches of uh, closed cell foam is a vapor retarder, so it slows the moisture in humidity or, or humid form uh, flowing from that crawl space through the floor system and then into the house. Uh, we've got a $600 rebate to help fix this, and this is the way, one of the ways that we can do it. Um, the first way is, uh, let's get my little pointer here, this is all foam insulation. This right here is a zero perm vapor barrier. Uh, when I'm saying zero perm, I want to make sure that everybody really understands that that means that there is absolutely no water in vapor form flowing through or, or from one side to the other side of that vapor barrier. So it totally stops all the water. And then um, that, that uh, vapor barrier is moved up on each wall at least six inches. Sometimes it's around a foot and then we mechanically fasten that and then foam over the top of that. That brings this space, the crawl space into condition space. So it would be like a uh, basement or uh, the inside of your house. And we want to make sure that some of that air is cycled, so there needs to be a very small return down there to pull some of that air out, get it run through the, um, the HVAC system and get some of the moisture taken out of that area. Another good idea is to have a drain down in that area, so in case there is uh, bulk water that somehow finds itself down there, it can drain itself. This is what that looks like in the real world when it's all finished up. You can see the closed cell foam surrounding the, the walls there. And then this is a zero perm vapor barrier that's taped over with the seams. 
um, that's the correct way of taping it as well. So that's a real good picture of what it's supposed to look like. The other way to do that is if you crawled under the crawl space and you see water, like bulk water, you see that the uh, ground is muddy. Uh, potentially you could see stuff like um, uh, lime deposits. It's kind of a white, soft, flaky material that's on the face of the dirt. If you see any of those things, we want to make sure that we don't do it the other way. We want to do it this way. And what that does is it we keep the crawl space ventilated, but then we foam underneath that floor deck and around all of the framing members. So this whole thing is encapsulated in a minimum of two and a half inches of closed cell foam. So what we're doing instead of bringing this space into condition space, we're keeping it outside of condition space and then insulating underneath that floor. This is what that looks like again in the real world. This is all closed cell foam and you can see that all of the frame the framing members are encapsulated in that foam. So HVAC systems. Um, currently, the uh, lowest sear HVAC system that you can buy on the market um, is a 14 sear air conditioner. This is an older slide, but we're, we're kind of going with, uh, with what we've got here. So the old standard was 13 sear. So if you bought a 13 sear air conditioner, and had anybody install it. That's what the sear would be that you get on the, the left side there. A sear is a seasonal energy efficiency rating. And so that's basically how efficient that unit is. So if you're buying a 13 sear and you're getting eight and a half sear whenever they install it brand new, you're not really getting what you're paying for. And that's what we're here for. We wanna make sure that not only you get what you pay for, but we get what we pay for as well. And so this is what you have to do to make sure that the HVAC system is getting the correct sear. Number one, you have to size it correctly. If it's not sized right, it's gonna short cycle and you'll have problems that way. The next piece up is uh, airtight ductwork. Now, there's a reason that we put our money where our mouth is for this. So that's why we have really good rebates for duct sealing and duct replacement. Um, the ducts are a, an enormous portion of getting the correct sear out of that unit. And if they're not tight, if they're uh, leaking air all over the place, we'll go through a few pictures here in a minute, um, then it, you're just wasting a, a ton of energy and uh, you're really not, not taking care of your health either. So uh, make sure that those ducts are tight. Next one up is correct flow. Uh, most of us have gone out in the summertime and we have uh, use the hose and you kink the hose in the middle of it, what happens to the water on the end? There's not as much water that comes out. Same thing happens with ductwork. So if you've got an octopus of ductwork up in your attic or it's kinked, um, I've even seen stuff that it goes around a really tight corner and there's very little airflow that goes around that corner. We wanna make sure that at, those runs are nice and straight and they go directly to the supplies and you're getting what your, the amount of flow that you should be getting out of that system. And then finally, proper charge. So uh, whenever the HVAC system is first put in, usually they'll have to add a little bit of refrigerant to it. And we wanna make sure that that refrigerant is topped off to the uh, standards that the manufacturer has given. If it's not, it's going to uh, not operate correctly, but you have to do all of these things whenever you're installing a new HVAC system get the, to get the sear that you're paying for. So it's very important for you to, uh, whenever you do get a brand new HVAC system, to come through our program and that way we can make sure that you're getting what you're paying for. Uh, whenever we use the blower door, we can actually find a lot of the leaks in ductwork without running the duct blaster. This is the way we do that right here, that cellophane that you see that's kind of hanging down on the return on the left side, the supply on the right side, shows me that there's leakage on the other side of that return or that supply. So whenever the blower door comes on to 50 pascals and we hear these things flapping in the wind, that's where we go first. Returns are some of the most leaky things that we see out in the field. Um, the returns can be sealed up with caulk, with mastic, um, we need to seal the vents, the, the little grills to the uh, sheetrock, and that way you're not going to have a lot of leakage around those edges as well. 
Um, this is a return. And as you can see, anytime that you have pieces, two pieces of material coming together, you could potentially have a problem with air leakage. This is a good example of it here. Down here is another good example of it. And you can actually see where the dirt is coming. It's kind of accumulated right there. That shows me that there's air leakage that's coming through the. So we need to make sure that all that's sealed up, um, seal it up with mastic and um, everybody will be happy and uh, it'll work great. This is a return right here. One of the things that I tell everybody is that if you see a return like this and there are dead cockroaches or dead bugs or there's other stuff like debris, dirt, sand, all kinds of stuff that's down here, not only do we need to clean that out, but that also tells me that that return is pulling air from places that it shouldn't be pulling air from. This right here, all of these pieces that are all connected, all that should have mastic on it. And so that air is being pulled from attic places, from crawl spaces, from interstitial walls, and those places are really not where we wanna be, be breathing the air. The picture on the right-hand side over here, um, I talked to the contractor about this and I was kind of inquiring how the air knows to go through the filter and not around it. Uh, he didn't have a good answer for me, but this is a good example of why we need to have a filter that actually um, fits the hole for the return uh, because the air doesn't know any better. It's gonna go to the uh, easiest way through. And that's obviously that filter isn't doing any good at all there. Here are a couple of pictures that, uh, you know, I, I sometimes it just shocks me what I see out there. But what these are, these little black boxes are sitting in the return. Now, the return is where the air flows into the air conditioner. And then that air is then distributed throughout the house through the ductwork. These boxes here, these two little black boxes are um, cockroach and on one side and mouse uh, poison on the other side. So we've got cockroach poison and mouse poison, which is made of strychnine. And that is in the airflow for the entire house. So we wonder why um, our kids are getting sick. Well, maybe we need to take the cockroach poison and the rat poison out of the return. That would probably help out tremendously. Getting to mastic and air sealing. So basically when you're looking at an HVAC system, including all of the ductwork, any two pieces of material that come together or any seam along that material should have mastic on it. And that's, it's just kind of a putty based material that goes over those seams and it seals everything up. We also can use caulk in some places. Um, these little areas right down here could use caulk or a putty material as well. Um, connecting the boots to the sheetrock and the uh, grills to the sheetrock, all of that should also have either mastic or caulk on it. And then again, all of these seams all the way down through the ductwork, all of that should have mastic on it. This is what a return looks like in the real world when we've got it all finished up. So um, on the left side, you can see, and the right side for that matter too, you can see the gray, this material right here, this gray material, that is all mastic and that's what I was talking about earlier. Every seam is sealed up with this kind of material and it uh, and you can see how clean it is too. That's the way those things should look. So getting to air conditioners, um, the SEER is the seasonal energy efficiency rating of the unit. The higher the SEER, the better the unit is. So if you've got a 20 SEER air conditioner, that means it's really efficient. As I said before, 14 SEER is currently the code, so you can't put anything in less than 14 SEER. Now, I had to take this picture and, uh, you know, look at this picture. This thing is really, really old. Um, I, I would guess that that's probably about an eight SEER air conditioner or maybe worse. You guys, if you're seeing air conditioners like this that are connected to your rental properties or your houses, let's get those things out. Um, they're not very efficient. They're gonna break really soon. And then you're going to have people that are upset with you with maintenance issues and stuff like that. So let's get those out of there. Um, PSO is a better than code program. So our rebates start at 16 SEER and they go from 200 to $800, depending on the higher the SEER that you've got. So again, you know, an $800 rebate would be in a 20 SEER range. Um, everything has to have an AHRI certificate for it. So AHRI is a third party. 
um, company that tests all of these machines and they make sure that the coil and the condenser are matched. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's basically a way of ensuring that this HVAC system is uh, put together correctly and it says what it says it, it's gonna do. So in other words, if it says it's gonna make 16 sear, it's actually gonna do 16 sear. So the coil and the condenser, this right here is the condenser. This little piece right here is the coil. And as I said, those two pieces have to be matched in order to get a rebate through PSO. They also have to be matched in order to get the correct uh, sear that you're, you've, you've purchased or you've paid for. So uh, one of the ways that we do that is ask for that AHRI certificate. If it says that it is a matched system, then we can go ahead and pay a rebate on it. Uh, but it's very important to make sure that those two pieces are matched. So whenever you replace these old systems, you know, you don't have upset tenants anymore. Um, the maintenance issue goes away because it's a brand new system. But the other thing that you could potentially be running into if you keep these systems in place is not only gas leaks and carbon monoxide leaks that we talked about earlier, but these things can be really dangerous. This is a 70 AFUE furnace and these are really, really old. Um, what happens is the coil or the, um, the heat exchanger inside these units can potentially crack or break and rust through. And if, but if that happens, then carbon monoxide then not only goes out the, um, the uh, flue, but it also penetrates in through the ductwork and is distributed throughout the house, which is a very, very dangerous thing. So we wanna make sure that all that stuff is, is uh, replaced and let us get some money for you on those for you for that too. All right, uh, moving right along, these are the window units that we see sometimes out there. These window units are um, eight to 10 sear at best, brand new ones are. Um, I hesitate to even guess what the one that's pictured here is running at. It's probably, uh, probably a lot less than eight sear. But not only are they an eyesore, but they also have air leaks all over the place. You can see right here, oh, go back. You can see right here, there's air leakage all the way around this cardboard. Now, the cardboard is, it doesn't have as good of an R value as the window that's right next to it, but it's also leaking all that air that you just bought whenever it goes through the air conditioner. And you really don't want that. The other thing is this is really not a long-term solution. Long-term solution is to actually fix the uh, HVAC system or replace it, get something that's really efficient in there, and then we can eliminate these things. So let's get these window units out of the windows and, and put them where they're supposed to be in the trash. All right, geothermal units. Um, this is a, uh, I'm not gonna say new, but it's fairly new, I guess, in our area. These are um, really efficient units. The, you have a choice of having either a horizontal or a vertical field. Um, in our neck of the woods, the vertical fields work better. They usually go down, each well will go down about 250 feet, and you should have one well per ton on this. Uh, but we've got a great rebate for this. If you're gonna replace a, an old HVAC system with a brand new geothermal heat pump, um, we've got $800 for that, plus a $350 uh, per ton um, rebate so that you can drill those wells. So. Um, if you're thinking about doing geothermal, definitely now is the time to get that done. Another option would be mini splits. Um, this picture on the right side there is a real good depiction of a mini split. You have an interior head and then the exterior condenser. Um, the interior head sometimes looks like this. It could be on a wall. Uh, we also, the, there are many manufacturers that do the flush mounted ones, and those are basically up in the ceiling right here. And it's flush mounted, so you don't see all of the, the pod and all of that if you wanted to go for a more aesthetic look. But uh, uh, suffice to say, there are a lot of different solutions out there. These mini splits are a great solution for an all electric house. They, in many cases, are there a SEER 20 all the way up to 25, so they're super energy efficient. And um, they work great in our neck of the woods. 
So um, we have come to the, the time for questions. I'm gonna go ahead and advance the slide one more. And uh, here's all of our contact information. Again, I'm, my name is Jason Fisher. The other contacts here, are Andrea, Curtis, and Maria. And then Lisa here, she is the contact for PSO. Um, she works directly for them and she manages all of these energy efficiency programs. So if you've got questions of Lisa, there's her contact information too. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, basically open it up for um, any questions that you guys that you guys have out there. I'd be happy to answer now. Thank you so much, Jason. We are open for questions. I don't see any yet. Please feel free to put those in the Q&A or feel free to put them in the chat as well. Well, once again, Jason, it seems like you have covered everything with such perfection that <laughs> no follow-up questions are needed. But thank All you right. for well, your contact information in case someone thinks of a question later that they would like to ask you. Yeah, that sounds great. And thank you very much for uh, giving us the opportunity to come in and, and talk to your folks about these great programs. We've got... Uh, we got a lot of ways to uh, make these houses more energy efficient and uh, really more valuable as well. So just give me a call and if you've got questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Well, we will end our webinar here and a recording of this webinar will be available on the City of Tulsa's YouTube page. Thank you so much for joining us.